Hey everyone, welcome back to The Deep Dive, where we take these super complex topics and like really try to boil them down to what actually matters, right? Yeah, exactly, yeah. So today, we're gonna to be talking about something pretty cool in quantitative finance. And we're gonna be basing our deep dive today on the post called Coding Trend Factor by Quantitativo. Mm -hmm. And this post, it basically implements this paper called A Trend Factor, Any Economic Gains from Using Information Over Investment Horizons. Right. And this is by Han Zhu and Zhu, and it was published in the Journal of Financial Economics in 2016, so quite a while ago. Yeah. But still very relevant today. Absolutely. And so basically, you know, this strategy, it claims to deliver like really strong returns. Right. Historically, at least. Yeah. And even outperforming a lot of these more traditional market factors, even during like you know, pretty serious crises and stuff like that. And it all revolves around this, this idea of building a single factor that's going to capture short, medium, and long-term trends. Right. So it's kind of like, you know, trying to, to capture the, the essence of trend across different time horizons and then use that to, to make some money in the market. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for tuning in to Quantopian's Quant Radio, your AI-driven podcast exploring everything related to quantitative finance. If you enjoy this episode, don't forget to like and subscribe to stay updated on future releases. For more Quant-focused content, join us at community.quantopian.com. There you can explore a wealth of resources, connect with fellow quants, engage in insightful discussions, and enhance your skills through our extensive range of online courses. Quant Radio is intended to help people develop their knowledge and skills in quant finance. This podcast is not intended to provide investment advice. And now, back to the episode. So let's start by talking about, you know, the academic paper like that's kind of where it all begins. So what were Han Zhu and Zhu like really trying to s figure out with this paper? So, you know, if you look at a lot of the existing research around stock price behavior, you'll often see things like short term reversals, momentum, long term reversals, all kind of looked at in isolation. Right. Yeah. So short term reversals suggest that after a stock has gone up for a bit, it might be due for a little bit of a pullback momentum. Says, hey, if a stock has been doing well, it's probably going to continue doing well. And long term reversals say, well, you know, what goes up must come down eventually. So th these are all these kind of different patterns that we see in markets, but they're often studied as separate things. And what Hanzu and Zhu wanted to do was say, well, can we kind of bring this all together? Can yeah. we create a single factor? that captures this idea of trend across all these different time frames. And that's what they set out to do with this trend factor. Yeah, like a unified theory of trend almost. Yeah, exactly. And the thinking is that this factor can potentially adapt to different market regimes because it's not just focused on one specific time horizon. So it can capture those short-term bursts of momentum, but also ride those longer-term waves. So how did they go about building this like trend factor? Like what are the building blocks of it? So the main ingredient is moving averages. Okay. And they looked at moving averages across a huge range of time horizons from just three days all the way out to a thousand days. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So specifically they used three, five, 10, 20, 50, 100, 200, 400, 600, 800, and a thousand days. That's like a lot of moving averages. It's very granular. Right. And the reason for this is that they're trying to capture very subtle shifts in trend at all these different scales. So you have the very short term three day average, which is really just capturing noise. Then you have the 1000 day, which is giving you this really long term perspective. And by including this entire range, they're hoping to create a factor that's sensitive to changes at any of these levels. So it doesn't get whipsawed by just focusing focusing on one specific time horizon. Okay, so that makes sense. Like you're kind of casting a wide net. Exactly. And seeing what you catch. Yeah. Okay, so you've got all these moving averages, right? Right. But you don't just like use them in their raw form, do you? No. So they calculate these moving averages at the end of each month. Okay. And then they normalize them by dividing by the stock's closing price on that last trading day of the month. Okay. And this normalization is important because it helps to ensure stationarity, which means that the data becomes more comparable across different stocks. And over time, you know, a hundred dollar move in a ten dollar stock is a lot different from a hundred dollar move in a thousand dollar stock. So this normalization helps to kind of put everything on a level playing field. Yeah, it's like, you know, taking the the actual dollar amount out of it and just looking at like the, the percentage move or something. Exactly. Yeah, it's about the relative change rather than the absolute change. Right. Okay. And so what data did they use to kind of test all of this out? So they used a massive data set of daily stock prices from January 2nd, 1926, all the way to December 31st, 2014. 
And this data came from the Center for Research and Security Prices, or CRSP, right. which is a super reliable source for historical U.S. stock market data. Okay, so they went way back. Yeah, they went way back. And what about the, the universe of stocks? Like, were they looking at you know, every single stock they listed? So they focused on all the domestic common stocks, but they did exclude certain types of securities like closed end funds, REITs unit trusts, ADRs, and foreign stocks, just to keep things, you know, clean and focused on a specific type of asset. Yeah, to avoid like weird outliers. Yeah, exactly. And then did they apply any other kind of filters to, to narrow down the universe even further? Yeah, so they had a price filter, which excluded stocks below $5 at the end of each month, mm -hmm. just to avoid those really low priced volatile stocks. And they also had a size filter where they excluded stocks in the smallest 10% based on NYSE breakpoints. Okay. And this was similar to what Jagadish and Tipman did in their famous momentum research. Mm. So again, the idea is to reduce noise and make sure you're focusing on stocks that are liquid enough to actually trade. Yeah. Okay. So now we've got this, you know, carefully selected universe of stocks over this really long time period. And we've got all these normalized moving averages. Yeah. So how do they then actually use all this information to try to predict what stock returns are going to be? Okay, so this is where it gets interesting. They have this two-step procedure, and the first step is all about running cross-sectional regressions each month. Okay. So let's say we're at the end of January, and we've got all our stocks, and we've got all our normalized MA values for each stock. Right. So for every stock, we've got those 11 different MA values. Now what we're gonna do is run a regression where we try to see how those MA values at the end of January relate to the actual returns those stocks achieved in February. Oh, okay. So we're looking for correlations between the trend signals at one point in time and the future returns across all these stocks. Mm -hmm. And we do this every single month. Wow. So for February, we'd use the MA values from the end of February to predict the returns in March and so on and so forth. So this gives us a time series of coefficients for each of those MA lags. So we have a coefficient for the three-day MA, a coefficient for the five-day MA, and so on for each month in our sample period. Yeah. And it's super important that we use the previous month's data to predict the current month's returns. Right. Because we don't want to introduce look-ahead bias. Yeah, you don't want to be cheating. Exactly. We want to make sure that the strategy is only using information that was actually available at the time. Right. Okay, so that's step one. Right. You're getting all these historical relationships between the trend signals and future returns. What about step two? Step two is where we actually use those coefficients to estimate expected returns for the next month. Okay. So let's say we're at the end of March and we want to predict April returns. For each stock, we take its current set of 11 normalized MA values and we multiply each of those values by the average of the past 12 months coefficients for that specific MA lag. Okay. So we take the current three-day MA and multiply it by the average of the last 12 months three-day MA coefficients. And we do that for all 11 MA lengths. And that gives us our expected return for that stock for the next month. And what's interesting here is that they don't include the intercept from the regressions in this calculation. Okay. Because the intercept is the same for all stocks in a given month. So it doesn't really affect the relative ranking of stocks, which is what we're really interested in. Right. Like which stocks are better than other stocks. Exactly. Okay. So we've got this, you know, expected return for every single stock. Right. Now, how do you actually build a portfolio based on this? So each month, we sort all the stocks into five equal-sized portfolios called quintiles based on their expected returns. Right. The stocks with the highest expected returns go into the top quintile, and the stocks with the lowest expected returns go into the bottom quintile. And then the return of the trend factor is simply the difference between the average return of the top quintile and the average return of the bottom quintile. So you're essentially buying the stocks that are expected to do the best. And selling the stocks that are expected to do the worst. Gotcha. Okay, so like what were the actual results of all this? Okay, so the results are pretty interesting. They found that this trend factor generated an average monthly return of 1.63%. Wow. Which is pretty high. Yeah, that's like really good. Yeah, and to put that in perspective, they compared that to other factors like short-term reversal momentum and long-term reversal. Mm. And all of those had significantly lower returns. Okay, so it's not just good. It's like way better than these other factors. Yeah, it seems to be capturing something unique. And what about risk-adjusted returns? Like how did it do there? Even better. The trend factor more than doubled the sharp ratios of those other factors. Wow. So it wasn't just generating higher returns, it was doing it with less risk. Okay, so like more return for every unit of risk. Okay. 
And, you know, you mentioned earlier that this thing also like held up pretty well during market crashes. Yeah. So this is one of the really cool things about this factor. During the 2007-2009 financial crisis, it actually had a positive average monthly return of 0.75%. While the overall market and those other factors like momentum and short-term reversal all had big losses. So it seems to offer some degree of protection when things get really rough. Yeah. Like when everything else is going down, this thing still managed to stay afloat. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the core takeaway here is that, like, by looking at trends across multiple time horizons, you know, in this very specific way, they found a factor that's historically, at least, delivered, like, really strong risk-adjusted returns and has even, like, you know, offered some downside protection during, like, really bad periods. And the idea is that, like, by combining all this information, you're kind of getting a more complete picture of what's going on. Exactly. It's not just about catching one specific type of trend. It's about identifying underlying shifts in direction across different time horizons. Okay, so for you, the listener, like, what, what we're trying to do here is, like, show you this really sophisticated quantitative strategy and kind of give you an idea of, like, how it works and the potential benefits of like yeah. looking at trends in this way. And, you know, the results suggest that this approach has not only been profitable, but it's also been like, you know, more efficient from a risk adjusted perspective. And it's even like held up during, you know, some pretty tough times. Absolutely. And what's also cool is that Quantitativo actually like took this academic research and showed how to implement it in code. Yeah which like makes it even more accessible. Absolutely. So it's a really interesting example of how you can take these academic ideas mm -hmm. and actually turn them into something practical. Right. Okay. So that was our deep dive on coding trend factor. Hopefully you found it insightful. Absolutely. And we'll see you next time for another dive into the world of knowledge. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>